for finding out the truth about our own thoughts, our own feelings, and our own motives. Now, remarkable that 80% of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions are unconscious, things that we really don't think about. But whether they're conscious or unconscious, God knows everything, right? Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. I just got to find Hebrews in here. Okay. And I'm starting with this for a, a reason which will become very clear in a few minutes. Chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Whew. I love that scripture for a number of reasons. First of all, it is, from a medical point of view, it is so beautiful that he speaks of bone and marrow, muscle and everything, getting right to the point. And he should know these things because he fearfully and wonderfully made us. He created us in his image, and that's just a wonderful thing. But so anyway, tonight, first session is going to be on management, managing stress and anxiety. And would any of you object or disagree with this statement? We live in a culture of stress. Okay. Do you think we had the stress, same, um, say, 30 years ago? No. 40 years ago? I would say I agree with you to a point, but I think that this element of stress has been with us since the dawn of time, since men first started walking the earth. I, I believe that this element of stress manifests itself in many different forms, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. This element of stress today is highly different than the stress that we would have experienced back in the 50s or 60s. But the 50s or 60s had their own elements of stress that we didn't have today. So this is going to be an interesting discussion, and I'm anxious to see how we go and how, how, how it moves forward. So our stress crisis, I would almost, there, I read one article a few weeks ago which led me to this teaching tonight that says that our culture now lives outside the boundary of God's created design. It is exceedingly clear, this is a gentleman from Newsweek, that the chronic stress of 21st century living is not mere inconvenience but a major problem that needs to be recognized and treated seriously. Unless we learn to slow down and change our hectic lifestyles, we will continue to suffer from cardiovascular disease, immune deficiencies, depression, and a host of other issues. Further, we will pass these traits, and this is where it gets really interesting. We will pass these traits and our poor coping skills, we will pass these on to our children who could experience even greater suffering. Now, some of you would be thinking, how can I, if I'm stressed out, if I'm nervous, I'm anxious, if I'm anxious all the time, how can I pass that down to my children? How could that be inherited by them through what I do? Is it absorbed by osmosis or do they just observe? Well, the answer to that is yes and yes. But I'll also tell you that, you'll learn this in a few minutes, that as we go through this cycle of stress, as we dig deeper in this, we're going to learn, and some of you know this from one of the lectures that I did for the pastoral care and counseling ministry, that the stress that we create in ourselves, the chemical imbalances that we create in our bodies with the, and how they impact the hormones actually change our DNA and open our future generations up to the same things that we're dealing with today. So some basic causes of modern stress. Well, first of all, we have an accelerated pace of life. Would anybody disagree with that? Here's the thing. When our bodies were originally created, our bodies were designed for camel travel, not the jet age. We have an intensified rate of change, primarily because of the digital world that we now live in. 
We have an increased rate of change. It seems like every day something else is changing. I mean, my goodness, you go to your Verizon store, you buy your new iPhone 13, you get home and you see an ad for an Verizon 14. Uh, the iPhone 14. I don't even know what number they're up to now. We live in a much more complex social setting and environment, and we have much more complex interactions, and the internet has actually complicated that more. The internet's great, but it has also sped things up. We are an instant gratification society. I want information, I want it now, and if I can't get it now, I'm going to go out of my mind. All of this leads to inadequate time for recovery, because statistics show that we now sleep less than we ever have before. So what does all this do to us? Because we've already made the determination that stress impacts our physical bodies and our mental bodies. Well, first of all, we, we have an increase in pain. We notice pain more, we feel pain more. And the reason we do that is because we have reduced endorphins in our body. Where do those endorphins go? Doesn't the body naturally produce them? Yes, but if we live in a constant state of agitation and stress, our body gradually wears those things down and they gradually diminish. And that's really dangerous for us in a number of ways. We live in a, in, a, in a time of increased panic anxiety. And the reason being is like we've lost our endorphins, we have eliminated a lot of our bodies, the brain's natural tranquilizers. Yeah, you heard me right. We have natural tranquilizers in our body that bring us down when we're too much, when we're too high. Well, chronic stress erodes those. We also suffer through an increased number. Statistics are showing that cases of increased cardiovascular disease are, are going up. And the remarkable thing that they're finding is some of these are actually induced by the way we live, but they're also seeing, as I just said, that this is being passed on through our DNA. Our immune system has been compromised. We're sicker than ever. We have increased fatigue and major depression, which we're going to hear about in the second session tonight, all of these because of reduced adrenaline resources that our body is naturally creating, but it's creating now in smaller numbers. So the essence of the stress response. First of all, definition for stress. Stress is the nonspecific response of the body to any demand that's placed on the body. Stress is the over-arousal of the adrenaline system. Okay, accelerated pace of life. Intensified rate of change. Increased rate of change. More complex social settings. Inadequate time for recovery. And I do apologize. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Well, there's a few more pages until the next blank, so you're good. In, inadequate time for recovery. More complex social settings. Anyway, okay. I will try to go slower. So, getting back to the essence of the stress response. Stress is the nonspecific, this is not a blank. I think you have this definition in your notes. The nonspecific response of the body, your body, my body, our body, to any demand that's placed on it. It's the over arousal of the adrenaline system. Prolonged excess of the stress hormones adrenaline, and our good old friend, cortisol. Could you put slide one up? So this is the body's stress response system. At its core, we have adrenaline and nor noradrenaline. Those are two hormones that are released when we start to 
get ourselves aroused, whether it's through anxiety or whether it's through any other measure that would generally, generally cause arousal. These things come from the, uh, the cortex of the brain. Then we have these things called cortisol and cortisol. These are what they call glucocorticoids. These things fight inflammation. They increase your blood sugar, which gives you energy, increases muscle tension, which gives you the ability. You've heard of the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. So in this case, cortisol is a friend. It's doing what we needed to do. We are out hiking, we see a bear, whoo! Our heart starts beating faster, or we start breathing faster. Our body needs blood sugar to convert to energy. That's what cortisol does. These catecholamines up here, the adrenaline and noradrenaline, they activate heart muscles. They raise our blood pressure, they increase our heart rate. They increase our heart rate because we need to pump oxygen in our body faster. So when we're agitated or when we're fearful or when we're scared or we're, we're either fighting, flighting or freezing, these systems are working together to elevate our senses so that we can take care of ourselves. This is the way God designed it such that when we are faced with something that's a danger to us, we can respond by protecting ourselves. And that's what the human body does because in and of ourselves, we're just lumps of cells put together. But when they work together like this, and this is another example of just how creative and how, how awesome God is in the creation of this human body that we have. That these things happen automatically. It's not like you have to punch a button somewhere on your body to say, okay, release more cortisol. It happens automatically. Some of you are getting at right now or releasing cortisol in your system because you're saying, what the heck is he talking about? I get it. I've been there. This fight, flight, or freeze syndrome causes increased wear and tear on our body, though especially if it's prolonged. The fight, flight, or freeze syndrome was created to identify a situation that's of danger to us and give us the ability to respond. We're either going to fight them, we're going to fly away, or we're going to deer in the headlights freeze. That's how we're going to respond. Those are the three ways to respond. There are no other ways to respond. So our body automatically starts doing the things it needs to do to give us the ability to run like the Dickens or to kick some booty or to stand there. Now, fight, flight, or freeze syndrome is created to give us an instantaneous response to a, a threat where we can address it and move on. And as soon as we're away from the danger, our heart slows down, our breathing gets slower, these chemicals in our body start to flush themselves out. But it doesn't happen right away. These things are created, they're released, and they happen almost immediately, but it takes time for them to be flushed from the system. So what happens if you go from one stress event to the next? You're fighting over here. You're fighting over here. You're meeting danger over here. You're meeting danger over here. Your body keeps pumping out more cortisol and more adrenaline every time you go through one of those and the levels go up. It may come down a little bit, but then they go up again, but they keep going higher. We want to see what happens then. In effect, the stress that we experience in those prolonged episodes of fight, flight, or freeze is basically accelerated dying because we're killing ourselves. Could you put the next slide up? So this is our stress coping system. Cortisol mobilizes us to action. It causes us to take action because it puts all the body systems in place where we can take the appropriate action. It retrieves glucose from our glucose stores and sends them to our muscles so we have energy. It enhances feeling of well-being. It gives us the ability, I am in control of my senses. I can see and experience everything that's going on. It gives us increased strength in coping and stamina so that we can fight if we choose to engage. Or I can keep on running if I choose to run. The chronic stress here is when cortisol crosses the line. Cortisol changes its function because our survival takes over this element of feeling good. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you had a really 
one of those fight, flight, or freeze moments. Okay. Most of us have at some point. Maybe it was... Maybe with each of us it was different. Maybe it was the first time you had to sit down and take your driver's license exam. Yes, that's a very anxious moment. Usually what happens is we have a fight flight or syndrome. Everything goes up, and then it, we face the danger, and then it gradually starts to diminish. Some scientists say it takes about four weeks totally other scientists think it takes a lot less, now, from a few hours to four weeks. That depends on the individual, and it depends on the element of stress that exists in the individual's life. But again, imagine, this is caused by a fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. Normally it goes down. What happens if it keeps going, and I can't jump that high anymore, I used to be able to. We become defensive because we're on edge, because our body's not returned to its normal state. We store glucose, we start to gain weight because excess stores of glucose equals obesity. Blocks anxiety receptors, so we're not able to relax. And we're gonna talk about a few anxiety cell um, receptors in a few minutes. Depression, irritability, elevated blood pressure, et cetera. So, as 2 Corinthians 4.12 says, so then, death is at work in us. So before we go any further, some of you will say, well, geez, you've told me all about this stress already. We're only 20 minutes into this. Is there any stress that is normal? Is there normal stress in our lives? Well, the answer to that is yes. There's this thing called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S, S, eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. This is stress that is deemed healthful, or giving one the fulfilling of the feeling of fulfillment. Now, what is this use stress? Well, use stress is short lived. It exists in smaller challenges like the excitement of a roller coaster ride, a scary movie or a fun challenge that you may take. These are all examples of good stress. Even a particularly tough workout that you may engage in can make you feel good. Those are the chemicals in your body doing what they need to do. Traveling can also create good stress because it, it can be uncomfortable driving to a place you've never been before. Taking an airplane flight to an area, country, a foreign country or something. But when you do that, you also learn, you also learn about cultures, you learn things, and you, you ultimately end up enjoying yourself. So the stress that you thought was going to turn out to be anxiety-filled turns out to be pleasure-filled. Even normal things that we enjoy watching can, or participating in, can be termed eustress, good stress. Although I will say watching Carolina basketball games lately hasn't been that enjoyable. So let's talk about, uh, let's try to get a better understanding of the differences but, and their impact of stress and what we would ultimately call distress. Because we know that certain amount of stress is good for us. I like to say a good amount of stress is good for us because it keeps us frosty. It keeps us awake. It keeps us alert. It keeps us focused on what we need to focus on. It crosses the line and becomes distress when we start to function in a negative manner. So how does that happen? Well, there's an escalation process. Stressors give rise to stress. You face a stressor in your life, and you begin to exhibit the signs of stress. You go on a hike, you bump into a bear. Maybe you're walking down the street, you feel you're being followed. What happens when you experience these things? Well, you become more aware of your surroundings. You become more aware of your exit points. You become more aware of starting to think, what do I do if the bear charges? What do I do if somebody behind me comes up and asks me for my wallet? We start to think of these things. And as we're thinking of these things, our body is releasing chemicals, the adrenalines, the, the cortisols, that give us the energy that we need to ultimately make the decision about what we're going to do. Prolonged stress, though, 
gives rise to distress. The bear starts to follow you. The person trailing you is getting closer. Your blood pressure is increasing. Your breathing is increasing. Your body is releasing more and absorbing more cholesterol. The result, if it stays at those levels, could be irreversible. Irreversible damage to your cells, to your body's organs. Prolonged stress can lead to stress disease. You know the most stressful job I was told in the world? Airplane traffic controllers. You know, the most stressful job. They have to be on top of things, constantly looking out for flights that appear or disappear. Prolonged stress leads to stress disease. Now, what is stress disease? Well, it's enlarged adrenal glands. It's, uh, it does damage to the neuronal or the nerve endings in the brain. It uh, can cause the hippocampus, which is a key little organ, peanut-sized organ in your brain, to shrink even further. The result is irreversible. We have this thing called predictable stress, such as the stress that you get when taking a test, or unpredictable stress, like when you see a bear in the woods, or bear scat, which means there's a bear in the neighborhood. We have this thing called controllable versus uncontrollable stress. Controllable stress it is, is, again, that's like taking a test. And it usually provokes the, the adrenal glands in the circulatory system. It gives us a mobilization for action, the ability to move a muscle, change a thought, the ability to sit at a table and think and work ourselves, work a way through a solution to a problem we may face in. Or, you know, you could be out in the field doing something, a hobby. It's associated with the adrenaline rush that you get. As the body releases a wave of adrenaline through your body, you feel, ooh, I'm supercharged, I'm ready to go. That's called the adrenaline rush. Controllable stress does that. Versus uncontrollable stress, which is stress you have no control over, again, that pesky bear, produces an increase in the brain neuronal systems associated with these stress hormones, the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. Little organs called the amygdala, the hippocampus, all these things get activated at the same time, doing what they're supposed to do the way God designed them, releasing all of these chemicals into our body to protect us. But if it keeps pumping stuff out because we don't give it a chance to have adequate recovery, then those levels stay high. And those levels, when they stay high, are not healthy which is why anxiety is closely trails depression is one of the number one issues that most adults face. This fight, flight, or freeze response was very important in ancient times. It's also ancient, very important today. I think it's more important today than it was ever before because we find ourselves in circumstances that just didn't happen 20 years ago. We find ourselves facing things in, the, in real life today that we just didn't experience 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It was important to us in ancient times. It's important to us today. But what we're recognizing is that today, because we live in such a stressful lifestyle, this fight, flight, or free syndrome and all the areas associated with it are becoming a liability. This, again, this syndrome refers to an involuntary physiological change that happens in our body and in our mind when we feel threatened. It causes rapid breathing, flushed, tense muscles, increased heartbeat. And again, this response was created to keep us safe, prepared us to face, escape from, or hide from danger. But people can experience this response, and this is why it's such a danger now, whether the danger is real or not which can lead to this response activating in, in situations where it's not necessary. You've heard of people getting freaked out. It's because of something that they have contrived in their mind that they believe is going to happen. So their body, well, if you believe that it's going to happen, I'm going to kick this thing in motion and all of these things are going to start to be released because if you believe it, I believe it. Also, people respond to threats in different ways. 
which is why we have three options, fight, flight, or freeze. Many times we experience an adrenaline rush when it's not helpful. For example, maybe some of you have felt this way before. How about when you experience road rage when somebody cuts you off? What happens? <laughs> Grabbing the steering wheel. Well, just that little simple action, your blood pressure has already gone up 20 to 40 points. You've already activated the fight, flight, or freeze because you're angry and you're agitated. And because of these things, all these systems are kicking into gear. But you can't do anything about it because you're in a car behind a wheel with your wife or your son or your brother or your husband next to you. So you just got to grip the wheel and hope it passes. And it gradually it does until the next person cuts you off and you do the same thing. You're pumping it up, letting it out, pumping it up. But the problem is it doesn't go out as fast as it comes in. Every heartbeat at an elevated blood pressure takes its toll on your arteries. Excess fat and glucose doesn't get metabolized, absorbed by the body right away. So it contributes to the plaque buildup in your arteries, leading to heart disease or stroke. So imagine that you constantly live in a, in, a, in a life that is constantly going up and down, but it stays more up than it does down, and your body continues to pump all this stuff out. Your plaque builds up. You have coronary artery disease or strokes. Cholesterol goes up clogging your arteries even more. Blood clotting increases, resulting in greater risk of a heart attack. Hands and feet get colder because of what's called vasopressin release. Even good stress is dangerous when it's not relieved. So, what are some of the effects of elevated cortisol and adrenaline? Well, as I said earlier, you could deplete what's called your endorphins. These are hormones. When endorphins get depleted, endorphins help you deal with pain. You begin to experience more pain. Endorphins are hormones that are released when your body feels pain. But that's why they go to attack the pain, so they are reduced. They are produced in your brain and are messengers in your body. Endorphins help to relieve pain, reduce stress, and improve your mood. Endorphins can be boosted by exercising, eating, having sex, getting a massage, and many other ways. That's how they can be produced. That's which is why there's such a big push. Everybody goes to gyms these days because they want to exercise. They want to feel good. And don't you feel good after a good exercise, a good workout? You know, you burn some calories, you build some muscle up, you take a nice shower, you're, ooh, it feels good. Your body starts to come down from the high that you got while the endorphin high, maybe you've heard of that, the adrenaline rush, the endorphin high, because these things are kicking off in your body as you're doing good things to your body. Flushing your system out. Consuming those bioflavonoids. But depletion, not producing enough endorphins can lead to these things. Depression, anxiety, body aches and pains, addiction, Sleep issues, impulsive actions, depleted benzodiazepines, which increases your anxiety, depleted serotonin. Serotonin is huge. Depleted serotonin is one of the major contributors to depression. See, serotonin regulates your mood. It's called your body's feel-good chemical. When your serotonin is at the right levels, you feel more focused, more emotionally stable, you feel happier, you feel calmer. Any of you ever read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World? Okay, I know some of you have. Well, in the Brave New World, the ruling class controls everything. So how do they handle the lower people, the masses of the lower people, the class three, four, and five people? Well, they give them this thing called soma. All it is is serotonin. It keeps them happy. Emotive, emotional, <laughs> rational, emotive. Um, er, yeah, think about that. The REIBT therapy. 
Serotonin is one of the things that they prescribe most because it helps people get to their happy place. Depleted immune systems lead to illnesses. I just said that. Depleted adrenaline leads to fatigue syndromes. Dopamine flooding leads to addictions. Anhedoniasis, which is the inability to feel pleasure. Cholesterol-based damage through the malabsorption of heart of uh, cholesterol leads to heart disease. So, before we get to the good stuff, I want to get to one more area of consideration here. The stress, anxiety, depression connection, because we're going to talk about depression next, and depression is the number one issue considered by the World Health Organization as a worldly illness. We're going to talk about the impact of chronic cortisol secretion. This little friend that we have called cortisol that helps us in so many different ways. As I said, when we have too much of it in our body, it turns into a bad guy. What this thing does is it blocks neurotransmitters. Okay? And what these neurotransmitters do is that they block the body's natural release of serotonin. They block the serotonin to keep the body from feeling good. When that happens, you're no longer calm. You stay at a higher level of anxiety. When you stay at a higher level of anxiety, you continue to pump out adrenaline and cortisol. But the more adrenaline and cortisol you pump out, the more they block the nerve connections from absorbing the serotonin that it wants to so that they can bring you down. Do you see the cycle? It continues to flood, continues to block, and the person's anxiety level increases. Ultimately, what happens, other receptors get blocked as well, and this ultimately leads to panic anxiety disorder, where a person is in a chronic state, a chronic panic attack state. Panic anxiety is the number one mental health women, a mental health problem for women in the United States. Panic attacks have a sudden onset and they reach their peak within 10 minutes. It strikes the strong, not the weak. Fear of fear, which is surprisingly one of the main reasons for this, becomes encoded in the brain if it's not adequately treated. Medication is required to alleviate it. Then we have this thing called agoraphobia. This is an anxiety disorder that's characterized by anxiety in situations where the sufferer perceives the environment as being difficult to escape or to get help. Imagine feeling like you're in an elevator with the doors constantly closed and you can't get out. That's what this type of individual lives in. Here's the thing, medications don't work with agoraphobia. Only cognitive behavioral therapy does. And we'll talk more about that next week. So, with all the bad news that I've just shared with you, you know there's gotta be some good news, right? So the question is, well geez, people are still living so what do they do to combat this? What do they do to get over this? Is there anything they could do besides taking drugs that will help them live a fruitful, productive, meaningful life in spite of the fact that they suffer with anxiety? Because I got news for you. Anxiety is not going away, right? We're going to have troubles. The Bible says we will have troubles, and we will. Whether it's financial, whether it's marital, whether it's parental, whatever. We will have anxiety. That's the way it goes. And we're going to have that until we take our last breath here on earth. So the sooner we learn how to deal with it, the healthier we can become because we will know how to manage it to keep it from hurting us, putting it back in the area of where it is our friend. One of the ways that we can manage this is to enhance our brain's natural tranquilizers. Now, 
this next statement is going to be shocking. Physicians, counselors, pastors often neglect these techniques that I'm about to listen, list. But the cost of these is zero. But their effectiveness is high. Number one, and here's your blank, relaxation training. Well, Randy, what type of relaxation training? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you. Mindfulness. Breathing. And when I say mindfulness, I'm referring to, obviously, Christian mindfulness. Breathing. Praying. Incorporating the spiritual disciplines into your life. Praying, meditating on God's word. The next one is stress management. Well, that's a big duh huh if I haven't ever heard one. Through self-regulatory strategies like behavior change. If something's not right, do something different. Analyze your life. Break down your life. Do a, a, a process map on, your pro, on, the, on the main processes of your life to say what, see what you do. Identify your stress points. Breathing. Exercise, praying. When you start to get anxious, and you can feel it. I mean, can let's be honest. Can you feel? Can you feel when your body's getting anxious? When, when you're getting up, I use the word uptight. Yeah, of course you can. And the way, you, the reason you can feel that way is because your body's starting to respond to the stress that you are perceiving in your head whether it's real or not. So when these things start to happen, well, cause and effect. If this, then this. So if I start to feel anxious, I know, okay, excuse me, I'm going to take a walk outside. I'm going to breathe for a little bit. I'm going to get into that still quiet place. I'm going to pray. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to meditate on God's word. I'm going to incorporate all these things to calm myself down. And when I calm myself down, the anxiety diminishes. And guess what? So does the production of all those chemicals that want to help you but aren't really needed for this level of anxiety. Here's your next blank. Improved quality and duration of sleep. Now, the material that my work is based on tonight said that, well, that sleep can be aided or natural. When I say aided, it's most commonly referring to melatonin. That's entirely a personal decision that one must make to help them. Melatonin is not addictive, but it can be habit forming. There's a difference. Natural sleep is that you don't need anything to fall asleep because you're tired enough. But here's the thing. If you've done a full day's worth of work, if you've gotten exercise in, if you've eaten right, if you've, done, if you've prayed, if you've had time for, for, for self-reflection and Bible reading, the spiritual disciplines, if you've had time to do these things, you should be exhausted at the end of the day. You should be able to fall asleep naturally. Now, I say that with the full understanding of, yeah, but. I get it, okay? But we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, too. We don't get enough sleep. I mean, the AMA recommends eight hours. I mean, come on. Does anybody get eight hours of sleep these days? Who said I do? <laughs> I, yeah, try to. That's one thing. I'm happy if I get six. I'm averaging about five, maybe four. But we need to get more sleep. And we'll talk more about this later because it's not just that we get more sleep, it's what we do while we're asleep. Next blank is physical exercise. Especially outdoors where you're breathing fresh air. But inside will work as well. And then there's the last blank is this thing called digital discipline. Reduce 
your iPhone use, reduce your internet use, because these things are constantly stimulating your mind. And when you're stimulating your mind, you're increasing your alertness level. And when you're increasing your alertness level, even a little thing like that starts to produce more of these chemicals. Make a pact with yourself. I will not use my iPhone after whatever time. If you're laying in bed trying to fall asleep and you're... Ch -ch 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 -ch. Now listen, some of you have... I don't know how you have your thumb still on board, but there's some of you can... I mean, I have to do this, but, but you're, you know, if you're doing that, you're way too active before you're trying to calm down. Stress produces what we call peripheral vasoconstriction due to adrenaline release. All that means to you is that your body temperature is going to change. And there are multiple, multiple ways to monitor your stress based on your body's temperature. Learn to read your own body. Do you have cold hands? Well, something that's not normal. If you've got cold hands, there's something going on somewhere, whether it's related to stress or a vasosuppressant reduction or what. <laughs> Something's going on. There's these things now, I didn't even know these things existed, called smart dots. They're miniature thermometers that you can use to check your temperature. You can even use your smartphone. I guess there's apps on your smartphone to monitor your temperature. What's that? <laughs> Everything in balance, Francois. Okay. And then there's this thing called adrenaline management. So you're saying, how in the world? I just can't stick a tube in my body and check the level of my adrenaline like I check my oil. But no, you can be strategic in how you use adrenaline, how your body uses adrenaline. Choose your battles and your emergencies carefully as to when you'll need adrenaline. Remember, adrenaline is a response to a situation. Adrenaline is a response, is a reaction to something that you're facing. So if you got to go in and do battle with your boss because your boss is any four-letter words you want to use or your boss is not fair or your boss is treating you badly, and listen, that's a stressful altercation. That's a stressful meeting that you're about to have. So you're going to get some adrenaline there. You're going to get hyped up. You're walking in the woods. If you walk on Cat Rock Trail right off 71 up to um, the castle, there's an area there. It's known as the Copperhead Snake Capital of Connecticut. So, yeah, you walk through there. You're looking around. Your heart beats a little higher. You know you're releasing adrenaline. How do you control that? You breathe. Number one, you breathe. You slow down. You choose the battles that you're going to have with the expectation, if I have this battle, I know I'm going to release the adrenaline that my body's going to need to help me with it, but I don't want it to stay there. Plan for high periods of high demand and prepare your body appropriately. And once you get into the practice of having the knowledge that if I'm getting worked up, I'm going to produce adrenaline, I need to slow things down. Plan for times of, your next blank is recovery. Plan for times of recovery for your adrenaline system following periods of high demand. This may include increased rest, hobbies, recreation, time with good friends, and yeah, prayer. That's your next blank. So recovery and prayer. Here's a big one. We're going to go back and revisit sleep now. Sleep, if you didn't know, is God's antidote for stress. How many times have you read in the Bible where after a battle or something, they went back to camp and they slept? So you know that there's a couple of types of sleep, right? There's non-dream sleep. Sleep where you don't dream. 
There's dream sleep. You've heard the term rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep. The purpose of non-dream sleep is the rejuvenation of your physical body. So when you're not dreaming, your body is healing. The purpose of dream sleep is the rejuvenation of your brain. And that's your next blank, brain. So I would encourage you to develop healthy sleeping habits. Don't bring your son's dog home with you. <laughs> don't watch your favorite sport team's football or basketball games that don't go off until 1130. So here's some ways to improve the quality of your sleep. If this is possible, and I know that in this day and age it really isn't, always go to bed and get up at the same time. This is important to establish your circadian rhythm. Darken your environment early in the evening to increase natural melatonin. Did you know your body already produces the melatonin that you want to take in addition to trying to go to sleep? So you've got to start preparing yourself. You can't have every light on in the house. Just watch the Carolina Duke basketball game that's on until your blood pressure is through the roof. You can't expect to go lay down and pull the blanket up and go to bed. It doesn't work that way. You need to recover. Try to go to bed at the same time every night. Try to get up at the same time every day the next day. Darken your environment. That means turn your lights off. Turn your TV off. Avoid stimulating activities within one hour of bedtime. Now, some of you are thinking some things right now, I know. Don't use alcohol as a sedative. Avoid caffeine after 2 p.m. It is better to do exercise in the late afternoon. Why? Think about it. If you exercise in the late afternoon, if you exert all that energy, you release all those good endorphins in your body. You work out, whether it's go for whatever your, your choice of exercise is. You work out. When you finish your workout, your body already begins the process of recovery. And because you've worked out, you've agitated some chemicals in your body, and you're flushing those things out, the bad stuff. Replacing it with the good stuff. That will help you. Athletes sleep better at night because they have a regimented routine where they work out the same time, and the only thing that messes that up is when ABC or Fox News puts their game on at 10 o'clock at night. Messes me up too. So exercise in the late afternoon if you can. I know there's some of you, and I used to be one of them. I would get up at 5 in the morning, and I would work out until 6, 6.30. Shower and drive up to Hamilton. It worked. It was an exercise. That was the way I looked at it. But the bottom line is, is that knowing now what I didn't know then, I would change my schedule to do that. And to be quite honest, I need to start doing more of this. The last thing that some people do is they use earplugs to avoid any variations in the sound, whether it's your heat coming on, whether it's your furnace kicking on, whether it's the ice maker downstairs or whatever. I don't know. I like the constant hum of something. To me, I find that rhythmic. Like a mmm. It puts me right to sleep. So, any questions about anxiety or stress? Julian, you've got to come up to the mic, brother. Hey, I, I'm helping you get your exercise. Don't complain. Can I sit down? This is weird, like standing in front of everybody. I'm going to sit down. Um, so for, for me, this is uh, kind of like my life because 
I think if you want to look at a perfect example of stress and anxiety, um, police officers have a life expectancy of 15 to 20 years less than the average person. Get out of that line of work. Um, uh, there's a reason I'm in it. Yeah. Um, the average time for a retired officer to live after retirement is about five years. So about 55 years old, depending on obviously how early you get in, when you retire, all of that stuff. And I see it all the time. I've seen people that retired and then the next thing you know, they pass away. And we are in a situation where we're put in very stressful situations, not just occasionally, but multiple times in the day. You might have a day where you have four or five situations where you just have that fight or flight um, reaction. So uh, I know the effects of it. I know that it can cause depression, anger, anxiety, addiction. I've seen it in coworkers. I've seen it in you know people that have retired. Uh, a big thing with cops is drinking and coping and dealing with stress in that manner. Um, but I think a big part of it is also perspective and um, attitude, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I love my job. And I honestly think that God put me there for a reason and equipped me to be able to do it effectively. Because for me, I've been, I've been on 10 years. Eight of those years, I've been a proactive narcotics unit. So proactive work. We put ourselves in stressful situations on purpose. Our sole purpose is to find guns, drugs, the worst of the worst. And you've been highly trained to know how to deal with those types of responses. Right. But, yes, but not everyone has the perspective to do it properly. Um, so for me, because I love, I've been in over 200, or I've hit over 200 houses, done search warrants. Go, you know, we're going to places where people have guns and don't like the cops and want to fight with us. I've been in over 50 car accidents. So very stressful things, but for me, I love my job so much that the stress is a uh, eustress, where I, I enjoy it and I find fulfillment in it. So I know my attitude and perspective helps me to not deal with it in a negative way. That Also that and cutting off work from home, from separate life and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, just to give some perspective to, you know, the, the, the power that stress and anxiety really have, it really is a, a killer. And acceler accelerated dying is a good way to explain it because it literally takes years off your life if you let it affect you in a negative way like that. And then obviously, first and foremost is our hope in, in Christ and, you know, him allowing us, allowing him to give us that perspective and that attitude to see those things as challenges more so than stressful things that we go through. Um, so, yeah, just to, just to give you guys a little bit of perspective on how serious it can be. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, each one of us, and thank you for, by the way, for what you do. You, I'll say the term, your breed is really a remarkable guy. When I say your breed, your brotherhood of, of officers and police and those that serve to protect. You know, you think about the, the types of jobs we have out there, whether you're a police officer, whether you're a first responder paramedic type individual, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a banker, whether you are a construction worker, each one of your jobs, of our jobs, has different stressors. I mean, just putting this lesson together, I'm just thinking, oh my God, are they going to like it or not, or blah, blah, blah. You stress yourself out. So the bottom line is we, we learn to develop our coping skills. We develop our coping skills that help us to address the stress we know we're going to encounter. So, you know, when I was working at UTC, if I had to go in and face a certain boss, I would go in there and I, and the, and the way I handled that before becoming a Christian and after becoming a Christian was entirely different. I'd go into a meeting before Christ and I would go out of it okay, but I would be rattling like, like a chicken bone on the inside. After Christ being prayed up, going in with the armor of God on, I'm breathing calmly. I'm happy. The day that I was let go, most people are bawling out their ears, they're getting crazy. Cool. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. So the bottom line is, 
is that yes, we know stress is bad for us. Too much stress is bad for us. There's a certain amount of stress that's good for us. It keeps us frosty. It keeps us alert. It keeps us awake at night when we're driving down I-95 to Florida in South Carolina. And the only car we see is for another 20 minutes. It keeps us awake. That's a stressful situation. Your body's pumping out extra stuff. But what do you do? You take breaks. You get up. You use the restroom. You walk. You get some fresh air. That's why they have these rest areas all over the place. They're not just for gas. They're for you to take the opportunity to break the monotony of what you're doing so that you can alleviate the stressful impact of driving on your body. So whether you sit in an office, whether you work at a hospital, whether you work out in the community, you're going to have your own level of stress, and only you know what those levels of stresses are and how you handle it. The material here suggested that these are the things that you can do to help you deal with your stress. Relaxation, breathing. That's why, that is why companies have in their, most companies, especially corporate 500 companies, have in their policies, you will take your vacation. Not you have two weeks of vacation. You will take your vacation. And you will have supervisors that come up. You haven't taken your vacation yet. You will take your vacation before this date. Because they know that you need to get out and decompress to get your life back in order, to regain your ability to think clearly and be the employee that they need you to be, that they're paying you to be. So that's the discussion on anxiety and uh, stress. I hope it was good for you. Um, I just have a few more things. Uh, uh, let's see. I don't know if I should do this or not. To everyone suffering from anxiety, you are not alone. There's someone behind you. I want to join an anxiety club, but I'm afraid they won't accept me. Pretty bad, huh? <laughs> why, why does the brain experience so much anxiety? I've been trying to put a finger on what's causing my anxiety, but my boss just doesn't like to be touched. Take your break, folks. <laughs> Okay, the uh, first session we talked about anxiety and stress, and I don't know about you, but it was pretty stressful. This session, we're going to talk about depression. <laughs> well, since we're going to be engaging in such a heavy topic, I thought I would take a few more minutes to share some of these delightful little jokes that I picked out. Why are people from New York always depressed? Because the light at the end of the tunnel is Jersey. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to get through this one without laughing. A really handsome man was involved in a catastrophic car accident. His life was saved by the medics, but he lost an eye. He is temporarily fitted with a wooden eye until a glass one can be inserted. Because of his vision loss, the man feels melancholy depressed and sits at home, moping. His pals eventually come over and bring him to a bar to cheer him up. He's sitting at the bar, looking gloomy, not saying much, and one of his pals comes up and suggests that he approach a lovely girl who appears to be alone at the bar. No, she'll never go for a man with a wooden eye, the man says. Okay, well, how about that girl over there? His friend responds, she has a really big nose, and my apologies to anybody with big noses. The man walks over to the girl and asks, would you like to dance? Very excited and shocked to be asked to dance by such an attractive man, the woman responds, would I, would I? To which the man responds, big nose, big nose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Going to do a George Costanza here. Okay, now I'm going to bring you down. Understanding depression. Depression affects nearly one in five Americans and is a major disability worldwide. The World Health Organization, this is what they say about depression. And these are your first couple of blanks as well. Depressive disorder, and that's your first. Depressive disorder, 
also known as depression, which is what we will call it from here on in, is a common mental disorder. It involves a depressed mood or loss of pleasure or interest in activities for long periods of time. Depression is different. That's your other blank. Depression is different from regular mood changes and feelings about everyday life. It can affect all aspects, every single aspect of life, including relationships with family, friends, and community. It can result or from or lead to problems at school and at work, obviously. Depression can happen to anyone. That's your next blank. People who have lived through abuse, who have suffered severe losses or other stressful events are more likely to develop depression. Women are more likely to have depression than men. An estimated 3.8% of the world's population, not just one state or one country, but the world's population experience depression, including 5% of adults, 4% among women, I mean men, 6% among women, and 5.7% of adults older than 60 years old. Now, that doesn't seem like small percentages, but when you account for the number of people there are in the world, it's millions and millions and millions. Approximately 280 million people in the world have depression. Depression is about 50% more common among women than men. Worldwide, more than 10% of pregnant women and women who have just given birth experience depression. More than 700,000 people die due to suicide every year. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death in 15 to 29 years old, most of whom are depressed. Although there are known effective treatments for mental disorders, more than 75% of people in low and middle income countries receive no treatment. Barriers to effective care include a lack of investment in mental health care, lack of trained health care providers, and a social stigma associated with mental disorders. You know, depression is very common in Scripture as well. I'm going to take a few minutes to engage in a few. We're all familiar with Job's friends, right? And I think in the last few classes we've had, we've talked about Job and his miserable counselors several times. So I'm not going to read the, the excerpts from Job, but you'll find them in Job chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. And in chapter 16 and 17. But it was in those scriptures, those sections, that the five S's of depression scripturally have been identified. Shame. Stigma. And these are all your blanks. Shame, stigma, separation from God, silence, and suicidal thoughts. That's that one long line. Right small. In Judges chapter 9, verses 50 to 55, we read about Abimelech who has his armor bearer thrust his sword through him. Not depression, but suicide. In 1 Samuel 31, verses 1 through 6, we read where Saul, what did Saul do? Saul took his own sword out and he fell on it. Suicide. Ahithophel in 2 Samuel 17.23, he also committed suicide. This one was interesting, though. It says in a few verses earlier in 2 Samuel, For the Lord had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel. 
to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. A few scriptures, passages later, now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house in the city. Then he put his household in order and he hanged himself and he died and he was buried in his father's tomb. And of course we know about Samson with the two pillars pushing them apart that they collapsed on him and then Judas. So suicide, depression, they go hand in hand many times. Many times they don't. Sometimes the person that commits suicide is not depressed at all on the surface, or so it seemed. And we're going to talk about suicide in um, one of our last classes. But depression, nevertheless, is extremely destructive. Depression affects, as we said, one out of five Americans. Severe clinical depression is a major disability worldwide. Depression can cause marital, financial, and career problems. It can be fatal through suicide, drug or alcohol abuse, and other major health issues. There is a link between depression and certain medical issues. And here's why. And it's very similar to what we just talked about in the last hour. Depression can actually decrease one's function. This makes it difficult for the human body to fight viruses or the things that are exposed that is exposed to. In addition, depression can lead to other cellular issues, not phone issues like cellular phone, but cellular in, from the from the components, the cells of your body. Cancer, for some reason, is very highly uh, related to people that suffer with and go through depression. Depression can increase a woman's chance of miscarriage. Depression can actually even make it difficult to become pregnant. Depression can cause early cognitive decline or dementia. Depression affects women twice as much as men and women tend to become, women tend to become depressed in their prime of life, usually around age 40. The sad news is that only about 21% of people who, were, who struggle with depression are adequately treated. So what are some of the reasons for depression? Depression is a symptom, as you would expect, that is derived from multiple, many causes. There's no one single culprit that causes depression. Though depression is frequently a clinical issue, that's blank, Though it's frequently a clinical issue, it may not necessarily be a clinical issue. So it could be, it often is, but it may not always be or not necessarily be a clinical issue. See, the thing is, is that each one of us, everyone, gets depressed at certain times. But there's levels to our depression. Sadness is frequently associated or labeled as depression. What do you think? You think sadness should be labeled as depression? I was very sad after Carolina lost a 1997 double NCAA tournament game. My wife even bought me blue, Carolina blue roses to help make up. Was it roses or balloons? I can't. Anyway. And I was sad. I was sad for a whole week, but I wasn't depressed. We're going to experience the highs of life and the lows of life. And the lows of life are going to make us sad. But that doesn't mean you're depressed. If it lasts for a certain period of time, which we'll cover in a few minutes, then we may have something else to talk about. Job 5.7 tells us, man is born to trouble as surely sparks fly upward. Jesus himself said, there will be troubles. We're going to experience those times of life where sometimes we just don't know what we do, and we're going to experience those times of life where we lose somebody or something, a job, a pet, a spouse, and we're going to be sad. But that doesn't mean we're depressed. Sadness is a part of life. Grief is a part of life. Death is a part of life. And it's one of the things like we are all, the one thing that we all have in common is that one day we will experience death, either our own or someone that we love. 
Depression can be a natural reaction, though, to loss. Whether it's loss of a job, loss of a family member. Depression can be secondary to lifestyle issues, hmm. such as fatigue, because fatigue can make you depressed. The question is, why are you fatigued? Sleep deprivation can lead to depression. There's that sleep thing again. Stress can lead you to depression. They oftentimes go hand in hand. Poor diets can lead to depression. Depression can be a reaction to anger or being upset, such as Nehemiah was standing before the king, concerned about Jerusalem. But see, when we go through these things, we have to ask, is this part of something bigger, or is this just God using our emotions to get our attention, to get us to change our behavior and do something differently? Depression can be a reaction to guilt, such as with David, or failure, such as with Peter. Depression curve occurs on what they call a spectrum, which can range from normal grief to adjustment reactions to a major depression. Just because you're sad and you're down doesn't mean that you should be labeled as a depressive, suffering from depressive disorder. So let's talk about what does qualify in that regard. Characteristics of major depression. Here's a blank. A constant sense of feeling sad, down, or blue for two weeks or longer. And impairment in one or more areas of life, such as a job, family, friends, relationships, or education. <clears throat> impairment in physical functioning. All of these things together could be signs. I didn't say are signs. I said could be signs because there's a number of things that have to be discovered that worked out. There are a number of conversations that have to be held. You, in your ministry of presence, when you're talking to somebody that they're low energy, their affect is way down here, and you may be thinking, I wonder if they're depressed. It's a good question to ask. To yourself. And then you begin to ask more questions, which you will learn as we go through the rest of this chapter. Depression is more than psychological. It's not just a head issue. It's not just a part of our psyche. It's more than that. It is a systemic illness. A person with depression will present with at least five of the following symptoms. Could you put those up, Shannon? Depressed mood, anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure, hopelessness, low self-esteem, impaired memory, difficulty concentrating, anxiety, preoccupation with negative thoughts, headache, fatigue, disturbed sleep. You can read the list. Somebody that's depressed... They can be diagnosed with depression if they have at least five of these, of these, I guess you could call them symptoms. I don't know about you, but I feel about half of those during an average week. <laughs> now, I just made a joke. And my apologies to anyone that may be on the borderline of being depressed. But you look at these, I mean, and there's some significant things going on here. Dizziness. Chest pain, joint, limb pain, back abdominal pain, GI complaints, sexual dysfunctionality or apathy, menstrual problems. I mean, that's a, that's, that is the total body, male or female. There's not a part of the body that's not covered by those symptoms. So if you're talking with somebody and they appear to be 
their mood is low. Maybe they, in your conversation, well, you know, you try to express the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and they say, I have no hope. I don't feel good about myself. I, I'm not attractive. I, I can't get a girlfriend. I, I'm dizzy all the time. My chest hurts. Okay. So if I'm having a conversation like that, I will, my next question, when's the last time you've gone to see a doctor? Because here's the thing. As lay counselors, as pastoral counselors, we may have an idea that this individual may be depressed but we can't diagnose them. And could you say, you know, buddy, you might be, you know, on the line, on the edge of, dep of being depressed. Now, there are different trains of thought that's very observant. And based on this class or other material you've read, you say, well, I'm checking my list. I've got my list. I'm reading it down. I'm checking it twice. And you've got six of these things. So that means that you are depressed. Not necessarily. Those are signs that they may be. So you would say, okay, I recall from this class that these things were issues. You know what? You might want to go see a doctor. You know, I'm here for you. I'll be here to talk with you. I'll go with you if you want me to, but I, th I think you need to be checked out medically. That would be the proper discourse to go here. The only thing that would change that And if you're sitting with somebody and they start talking about suicide because of their depression, that's a game changer. You have to take action there. If somebody talks about suicide, your questions are exploratory. And we'll talk about this in the last class. Do you have a plan? How would you do it? Do you have the means to do it? If they say, well, I would shoot myself. Do you, well, do you have a gun? Yeah, I do. Bing, bing, bing. Those are the red flags. So then you know what? I just don't feel comfortable leaving you or leaving here. Do you mind if I call somebody so we can get some help here? And you call 911 or you call the 888 National Suicide Hotline number. But we're going to talk about that next week or the two weeks from now. So anyway, this chart connects a lot of the dots to somebody that may be depressed. The connection between physical pain and depression is real. Often people will not even attribute their pain, their physical pain, to their depression. They may, just because their knee aches or their hips ache or they got pain in their gut, they may think that is something they ate or something else that's going on, not even realizing that it could be related to their depression. 60% of those struggling with depression are treated by their primary care physicians. Their OBGYN doctors... And only 15% of patients are treated by psychiatrists. Christians are not exempt from this population. That's your next blank. In fact, prescription pain medicine problems are one of the biggest issues in the church because many Christians seek help for pain rather than truly addressing what may be an underlying depression. So, what are some of the reasons for depression? My God, we could be here all night. Obviously, there are a number of psychological reasons why people become depressed. This is a lengthy list, but we'll get through it. Unresolved grief. Loss. Going back to that unresolved grief, I think that, again, I'm going to encourage you to come to the, this event that's being held here, this talk in church that's being held here this Saturday, which deals with grief. Trust me, I, I feel just strongly about it. You will be blessed. So unresolved grief, loss, trauma, whether that trauma happened last week or 25 years ago. Anger, hopelessness, fear, unforgiveness. The, link is a, the list is a lot longer, but those are the top seven. 
There's also many medical reasons that cause depression. And none of these should surprise you. Cancer, thyroid disease, prescription drug side effects. That's why it's important to read those indications and contraindications on your, on your prescription because a lot of them do cause depression. Sleep apnea. Menopause and hormonal issues. Now, are you ready for the last one? Vitamin D deficiency. Drink your milk, boys and girls. So here's the whole truth about depression. It's very physical. Depression can be caused by a variety of medical problems, as we've just seen. The brain plays this by the same rules medically as other organs in the body. If you take something for you, in some part of your body, it could impact the brain. The brain networks with the other systems of the body, and it controls them. This computer we have in our skull is an amazing device. There's nothing like it in creation. I don't care how good AI gets, it will never replace the human brain. Depression is not always triggered like anxiety is. Depression is very debilitating and it is highly stigmatizing. Depression tends to be recurrent over and over again. It occurs over and over again without treatment. Depression is not consistently related to one's level of spiritual Maturity. Shannon, you could just throw that picture of the brain up real quick. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Here's your brain. No, I'm not going to show another picture of your brain on dope. I do have those stuff. Here's your brain. The most, the greatest organ ever created. All of our troubles with the brain start in this area, whether it's stress, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, it starts with the amygdala and the hippocampus. That's all you need to know. Those are two little glands. The amygdala is about as big as the tip of your pinky. The hippocampus is just a little bit bigger. They are the things, they are the glands that control all your mood disorders, all your emotional content, all your impulse control and your, your ability to judge. To judge. The amygdala, that little thing right there, it controls your emotional memory. Everything you have ever experienced in life, every picture, every scene, every movie, every person, whether you remember them or not, are stored in that amygdala. The hippocampus regulates your non-emotional memory. And then there's this thing, and the doctors love to talk about this. It's called the chemical imbalance theory. And the way this works is this theory asserts that depression was caused by chemical imbalances in that brain that's no longer there. Specifically, lower serotonin levels. And what did we know about causes lower serotonin levels? Oh, anxiety, stress and could therefore be treated effectively with drugs that restored the serotonin level balance. Now, this is a very popular theory for a while. It gained a lot of momentum. Scientists said it provides clear answers to both physicians and their suffering patients. It gives them an elegant explanation for why they feel the way they do their symptoms. And they cure a healing mechanism that's readily available in pill form. Pharmaceutical companies made a killing. But before long, some problems started to surface in examinations. First, antidepressant drugs turned out to be far less effective in treating depression than they were advertised. About half the patients that took those medications received no relief from their, from their suffering. And many of those who did benefit found the relief to be incomplete and the side effects were horrible. Second, the chemical, balances, chemical balance imbalance hypothesis, the notion that low serotonin caused depression, 
and that antidepressants work by elevating those levels, it failed to gain empirical support. That means it couldn't be it couldn't be proven by data. So, in 2022, a survey was done, and it actually was more than a survey. It was a thorough examination. And the results of those, the conclusions of those surveys were clear. The main areas that were specifically focusing on the serotonin research provided no consistent evidence of there being an association between serotonin and depression and no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lower serotonin activity or concentrations. So this is what the lead author of the study had to say about that. I think we can safely say that a vast amount of research conducted over several decades, there is no convincing evidence that depression is caused by serotonin abnormalities, particularly by lower levels or reduced activity of serotonin. Many people take these antidepressants because they have been led to believe that their depression has a biochemical cause. But this new research suggests this belief is not grounded in any evidence. But... The study did find a strong link between adverse and traumatic childhood life events and the onset of depression, which points to the possibility that there are environmental stress factors that are associated with the depressive disorder more heavily than do any internal brain process, such as the ability to generate serotonin. One interesting aspect of the study was how strong an effect adverse childhood experiences played in depression, suggesting low mood is a response to people's lives and it cannot be boiled down to a simple chemical equation. So here's the thing, the upshot for this study is twofold. First, you should realize that while antidepressants may work for you, they do not work for everybody. And here's the really thing that knocked my socks off when I read this study. And a conclusive finding, we do not know how these antidepressants work. Anyone who tells you differently is lying. So if you hear a medical professional telling you one day because you're in a doctor's office feeling like you're depressed, and they start using the term chemical imbalance in your brain to explain your depression, get up, pack your bag, and leave. You're hearing a fictional narrative or a pharmaceutical sales pitch, not scientific fact. Well, that's a nice story, but it doesn't really solve the problem of helping us understand depression any better. So let's take a look at a few things. Let's look at the impact that chronic stress has on our depression. Adrenal glands, as we know, go into flight or fight mode, which releases the neurotoxin cortisol and other inflammatory hormones. In a short-term period, these neurotoxins give a person more energy to face the daily challenges and to attack infections in our body. But if these neurotoxins stay elevated for long periods of time, they start to turn off some brain cells. And in turn, and this is really frightening about this, the hippocampal region of the brain, which is responsible for our non-emotional memory, begins to shrink. Brain-derived neurotropic factors, the, 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 these are the things that, that, the, that, that help the flow of information from one point of your brain to another. Those factors decrease. There's this thing called neuroplasticity, it stops. Now, neuroplasticity is, 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 a, is wonderful. Neuroplasticity is when you have a damaged area of your brain, your brain actually begins to regenerate new brain material that can replace the material that's died giving. And they didn't know this before until about 15 years ago. And this means that somebody that suffered from a TBI, like a combat soldier or our son, the ability or the ability of their brain to regenerate new cells that can learn, it's, it's, an, it's amazing. But in depression, those activities stop. There's a number of other 
as you would imagine, as other networks in the brain that become irritated and inflamed in the course of stress and depression. And these things, when they stop working, it's kind of like your car. Have you ever driven your car, say it's a six cylinder, and all of a sudden cylinder number four stops working and you get that knocking, that rattling noise, and then other cylinders stop working and your car is shaking and jerking? That's kind of what happens with your brain as a result of the impact that depression has on it, the way the body reacts to the brain. So, but I wish it were just as simple as that. It's not just the brain that gets impacted by depression. Depression affects, it is associated with so many other, what we call comorbidities, other areas of your health that, such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and bone mineral density. Depression can impact those to the point of where somebody is starting to get not only depressed, but their bodies are starting to essentially break down. Blood clots easier, which is not a good thing. It's a good thing if you're bleeding, you have a laceration, but if your blood clots internally, that can lead to a heart attack. Cholesterol increases, irregular heartbeats, high blood pressure, increased amounts of insulin in your body, not good for diabetics, Supp suppression of the immune system that makes you sicker. So, is there any hope? Well, first of all, there's always hope in Christ. So we serve and we believe in Jehovah Rapha, the healer, that can bring about complete and total restoration of all the brain cells and everything that needs to be restored in our body. Okay, that's what we believe. A lot of people don't believe that. Okay, so we go to doctors because going to a doctor is wisdom. If you're a Christian and you're suffering from depression, again, you're not immune to this. This is going to happen to some people. Here's how depression progresses. Adverse effects of each successive depressive episode for some continue to build up. For others, they are standalone episodes that are not linked, that are not concatenated, that are linked together but singular episodes over periods of time that are non-recurring in sequence. But eventually, you don't need stressors to kick off a depressive episode. Most of the time, if you have, whether it's constant or singular, you're going to be identified as a depre with depressive disorder. One study showed that the probability of recovery diminishes with each increased duration of a major depressive episode. And this is, I got ready to say this is really depressing, but this is really disturbing. There is a 54% recovery rate with a duration of six months or less if you recover from a depressive episode. Where I went, what the recovery means is that you suffer with depression you were given some form of treatment, whether it was antidepressants or whether it was other methods that terminated or caused you to cease from having depressive episodes. And, and after six months, what they're saying is, is if you haven't had a single episode or time of depression, 54% chance that you won't have another one. Uh, those are good odds. I'll take those odds. But if you have another episode within one year, that drops down to 16% that you won't have another one. Only 1% recovery rate with durations less than that. So this is why, you know, the, the thing about depression, because it is so stigmatizing, is a lot of people are hesitant to seek medical help because they're more concerned about what their friends or their family will think Especially, think, imagine this, imagine that you have been suffering from so many of those issues, those medical issues that were covered up there earlier. And you've been going to every doctor and they haven't been able to put one and one together to determine that they never asked the right question about, how are you feeling? Are you depressed? Because that could be the common link here. But imagine that you're a family member, that you've gone to all these doctors and your family's just so tired of you going to the doctor, all the medical bills and everything. So you stop going. 
That's the part of the problem. People stop going to the doctor because of the stigma associated with depression. But whether you've suffered for one month or 10 years, you should still seek medical attention. Depression is a medical problem that can be aggressively treated. It's not a psychological problem. It's a medical problem. There may be a psychological portion of it. For instance, if you were sexually abused as a child and you suffered an ch adverse childhood experience, we already know that that increases the opportunity, the opportunity, the likelihood that you may suffer depression at some point in time. So that being disclosed could open up the doors for some, some psychological help in addition to the medical help. It's a team approach. Now, one thing I will say, those recovery rates that I just mentioned to you, they do not account for the healing power of faith in God. And we're almost done here. So what are some of the treatment options? Well, treatment may involve medication. But even if medication is involved, treatment should be supplemented with diet, exercise, sleep, nutritional supplements, prayer, which is one of your blanks, maybe some psychotherapy, definitely some counseling. Whether that's professional counseling or pastoral counseling. Now, some of you may ask, well, what are some of the common antisuppressants? Well, listen, they got long words here, and I'm not going to go through them all, but I'll just talk about two briefly. The two most common are what's called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. And all they do is that they, there's a nerve ending here and a nerve ending here. And like I said earlier, there's this little gap in between. Well, see, that's where all the serotonin goes. And as long as it's in there, it keeps you happy. It keeps you feeling calm. So what these reuptake um, inhibitors do is they keep the nerve ending here and the nerve ending here from being active such that those serotonin things stay in that little gap. And the longer they're in the gap, the happier you are. That's what you want, isn't it? You don't want to be sad, you want to be happy. So that's what those reuptake inhibitors do. They keep those little neurotransmitter things in here that says, that sends signals to the brain, don't worry, be happy. And they work. So those were the two. Well, there's one. I told you one. There's the, the SSRI and the SNRI. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So SSRI, SSNI, don't worry about it. That will not be on the test. You won't be prescribing those. But it's important for you to know those because those are the two most common medications provided to those that suffer with depression, and that's how they work. All they do is they block certain nerve endings from talking to each other, keeping the feel-good serotonin in the gap where it continues to send signals to the brain, be happy. And people that take this are genuinely happy. Final thoughts on antidepressants. Antidepressants are not always necessary, but when they're needed, they are absolutely essential and crucial. Antidepressants are not addictive or a forever need. And I think you have these in your notes. Antidepressants depressants do have side effects. An antidepressant will keep you from feeling numb, but it will not give you love. An antidepressant may keep you from being depressed, but it will not give you joy. An antidepressant may keep you from feeling anxious, but it can't give you peace. An antidepressant may give you a desire to be around people, but it will not give you a sense of being, <laughs> a sense of patient long suffering for those who get on your last nerve. In other words, it, it won't help you tolerate people better. An antidepressant may stop you from being irritable, but it can't make you kind. 
An antidepressant may take away hopelessness, but cannot give you a sense of purpose. And here's the thought that's not on here. Antidepressants cannot take away God. God is still there. An antidepressant is not a substitute for God. We still need, as Christians, as lay counselors, as fellow workers in the ministry of presence, we still need to come alongside these folks and offer them a hope in Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate healer, who can, wherever it says cannot do this, who can do exactly what the antidepressant couldn't do. Jesus can give you peace. Jesus can give you joy. Jesus can show you love and help you find love. Jesus can give you patience to be long-suffering. Jesus can make you kind. Jesus can give you a purpose because his word says so. Here's the final thought. Depression is a major and complicated problem. Those struggling with it need others to come alongside them, continue to pray for them, be the hands, eyes, ears of God as they help walk them through their daily experience of depression. Your ministry of presence, you, can make a difference. Questions? Well, Corey's going to be a gentleman and bring the microphone to you, Frank. It's not necessary for Frank. Well, it is because Lori said so, and it has to be recorded. If it's not in the mic, it's not recorded. Thank you, sir. Test. Okay. Yeah, um, you were talking about people like, for instance, that might have gotten, um, you know, a, a childhood trauma or something like that. Now, have you seen in your experience when you've, you know, been counseling them that you got them to forgive that person and then their depression has gone away? That's a hard question to, to answer for a number of different reasons. In our counseling we've done here, we've only come across a few that have admitted to having adverse childhood experiences. I'll speak for myself. You know, you, most of you know my story. If you've come to CR, you've heard my testimony. I was sexually abused three times when I was seven years old, six and seven years old. So where do I fall in that study? I can't say that I've ever been depressed. I've been sad, but I suffered through a number of other issues that I had to deal with in growing up, even into adulthood. These studies show that, but, and I'll go back one more thing. The thing that helped me address what happened back then in 1962, 63, was Celebrate Recovery. It helped me work through those issues. It helped me, yes, and I did forgive my mother and my father. So the studies have shown that those people that, and this it was really more indicative of somebody that, for like a child that's in a home that is completely and, and routinely and recurringly abused by a relative, a brother, or something like that, where the sexual abuse, just it wasn't a one or two off time thing, it's an everyday thing. Such they, they live in a constant atmosphere of stress where every time they see this relative, they're stressed. And they see this relative every day because the relative lives with them. That's the type of individual that could not only suffer depression, but I will tell you, based on the studies and the, and the, the adverse childhood experience study by Dr. Folletti back in you know, 2010 or whenever, that thing, it launched a tremendous amount of studies. And what it did was it brought to light that people that suffer recurring issues like this, not only do they suffer from the psychological effects, not only do they suffer from the physical effects of the abuse, but their bodies, like the examples that we provided here, pump out adrenaline and cortisol 
And their bodies change. They get sick. Their systems break down. But as I said in the first lecture, the, the amazing thing, the, I guess one of the, one of, a couple of good things came out of that study. Well, a lot of good things. But one amazing thing was they learned that a 45-year-old gentleman that had a stroke, they, nobody knew this. He had a stroke. They learned that he had been sexually abused when he was six or seven years old, and that impacted him all of his life to the point where it changed his DNA, and he passed that DNA. They took the DNA of his kids, and those same elements of his DNA called telomeres, those same telomeres agents that were modified in him turned up in this son, which in that particular area of that telomeres that it dealt with, dealt with issues of the heart. So the answer to the question is, you know, can being exposed to an adverse childhood experience, offering forgiveness to the perpetrator of that experience, does that resolve one's depression? I can't answer that. I, I haven't seen any work, empirical evidence, that would state that it has or it hasn't. All I can say is, is that based on the studies that have been done, is that these things that happened back then, a lot of people blow them off. Well, it happened 30 years ago. It's no big deal. You know what? It is a big deal. It's a huge deal, especially to the person that it suffered with. And yeah, I'm a little passionate about that. But so anyway, from that perspective, um, that study, when I read that, it answered a lot of questions. Not for me, but for some of the other studies that I've read. So if there's anybody in here that has been impacted by such a thing like that, you know, or maybe you have a family member or you know somebody that was, and we're just, we got about two minutes left. All of these, you know, nothing happens to the body that isn't connected to something else. That's how wonderful our body is. It's degraded. You've seen the, 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 the maps and all the, 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 of the bloodstream and the nervous system, how it's wonderfully and complexly made. Well, it's made that way because God designed it. And it's all these things work together for our good. But when they're abused, like constant levels of stress, that's when they start to break down and they can become our enemy. We want them to be good. We want to live lives that will help us do what we need to do to take care of our bodies, to get the rest, to get the sleep, to eat the right foods, to so don't drink this and don't do that and go to bed at a decent time. All these things are simple things we learned in kindergarten. We need to do them today. Julie, you got one last question. Um, what's your opinion on counseling people who are on medication? Um, one of my pet peeves in the world now is the over medication of people mm -hmm. and the over uh, diagnosis and you know quick fix with, with medication and pharmaceuticals. But we're also not doctors, so we we're not qualified to say what medications people should or shouldn't be taking, how it makes them feel, doesn't feel. So because we know God's a healer, because we know that ultimately, you know, Christ can change people. How do you balance counseling people in the spiritual and as opposed to the physical. Like I would never tell someone to get off medication mm -hmm. if they're feeling depressed or anything like that. You know, God, God can heal you, God can, God can restore your life. Yes, I believe all this stuff. I'll never tell anybody to get off medication, but how do you balance that with the over medication that's going on in the world right now? Well, the, the answer to that question is simple. Um, when we start to counsel people, um, I send out an intake form. And one of the questions on that intake form is, are you seeing another phys uh, a medical physician and are you on any prescribed medication? Sometimes there's an answer there, sometimes there's not. And the reason I ask that question is, is that uh, it's not that I'm being nosy, it's that you know, I need to know that because it helps me understand where you are. I, you know, if I'm not familiar with the medication, you know, I do my research on it, what the effects are, what the side effects are, what it does, what it can't do. And when I meet with the person that I'm counseling, it's, you know, I understand that you're taking this. Okay, you know, do you mind if I ask what you're taking this for, just for clarity? And I hear them say it. I said, okay. But I will never tell them not to take it. If it has been prescribed by a medical doctor, they outrank me. So, you know what? Yes, you're right. I tell them that the Holy Spirit, you know, can bring about healing. The Holy Spirit can, you know, cover all the illnesses and things like that. 
But I will not tell them to stop taking the medication. I, I'm not, I would not even tell them, well, maybe you shouldn't take the medication. I, I, but I would say, if it was impacting him negatively, maybe you need to have a conversation with your physician about the medication that you're taking. And then you can get a, have, make an informed decision as to whether or not to do that. Because only, only you, by the way, know if the medication is helping you. You know, if you, were taking, if you weren't taking the medication and you were hurting, you were doing this or whatever, and now you're taking the medication and you're not, well, by all indications, it may be working. Now, from a Christian perspective, a pure spiritual perspective, you know what? We know that God can heal that and he won't need that medication anymore. Well, how does he know that? Well, he'd have to stop taking the medication because the medication will continue to do what it's supposed to do whether the ailment is there or not. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, God gave us wisdom to sometime go to doctors. And, you know, a lot of doctors do have their best interest, their patient's best interest in heart. And I have to believe that all doctors, since they, you know, raised their hand and swore the Hippocratic Oath, they follow the same discourse. So, it's a good question. And, um, again, you, in, in your, I'm sure that in your ministries of presence, you have all sat down and had conversations with people that are taking some form of medication. Okay? You know, that, that's fine. You know, understanding why they take the medication, maybe, some, maybe your business may not be. It depends on what you're doing, the type of relationship you have with that person. But the bottom line is we, you, are not in the position to tell somebody that you love, that you sit with, well, I would stop taking that medication. No. No, that's not what we do. We're not authorized. We're not allowed to do that. We are lay counselors. So, anyway, I hope you've learned a lot with this. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about grief, and we're going to talk about crisis counseling. So, if, uh, if you're still interested in this stuff, come on back. If not, well, it's been an off pleasure, and uh, <laughs> y'all be cool. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>